This leads us to the next participant that I'm so excited to introduce. So next up is Tracy Narkoshe Thompson. And she explores the latent ability of common materials to transform into new and unrecognizable shapes. And she's been working with the post-production of food, among other things. Please, Tracy, the stage is yours. Thank you. Hello. Oh, OK. Uh, um, thanks for extending an invitation to me. And uh, there's a whole big community behind my back. Uh, greetings from Black Star Alliance community, uh, which is in Ghana. And um, yeah, with a little bit of intro to my um, own work, this presentation is not just uh, centered on me, but um, you know, like rhizome, it begins to spread into how um, other colleague artists also inspire me and also the artists here whose works I would say is equally engaging with the things I'm dealing with and we're all dealing with. Okay, so yeah, I titled this presentation of decompositions and synthesis. I think synthesis at times has uh, <laughs> quite an interesting history and how do you call it, um, a problematic history when it comes to you know synthesization of uh, things in nature and all of that. Um, for me, I'm neither here or there, <laughs> and you would see that in my um, presentation. Um, okay, so yeah, this is Black Star Line's logo. This is just to inform some of the um, articulations that inspire how I approach my work, and I think it's very critical and very important to the things we are dealing with. And I like the fact that the um, theme was about you know the future of soil and all of that and making all these speculations but at the center of um, everything of matter of nature of human is still an alienness we we um, I come from a point of you know just like a, a black hole um, there's something about it that absorbs every entity and you know it's like at its what's behind the event horizon, we cannot know. There's something always larger than um, what we think. And uh, it's the same way this strangeness, you know, um, gets hints on, like when COVID comes in and all of that. Does COVID virus care or know what human is? You get what we mean. So these are the critical things we deal with. Yeah. And... Uh, this um, Lisa Soto, who is an amazing um, artist in the Blast Alliance Collective. Uh, this, this is a very interesting image that really strikes me, though she tries to you know, create this analogy with you know, the idea of the black holes and you know, where every entity is almost starts from a certain void. You know. And what's in, I know the typical image of a soil will be uh, what we know out there, you know, the dirt and all of that, yes, but um, the potentiality of things for me is where I would stand, you know, just like black holes, the collapse of stars, you know, but it still has a potentiality, a potentiality to become. We, um, there's a point in time where we do not know what even human is and how we even evolve in the first place. There's always that. And for me, um, yeah, what we'll see as cement, you know, also having a bad name equally as an industrial material. But this is, um, yeah, sorry, usually when I do presentations behind me. <laughs> sorry. So, yeah, so this image, some would think it's not of life, but it's life there. We see all the time. For me, it's the invisibles, it's the things that are lurking within the crevices of things that are not so obvious. And yes, we see moss growing on cement, we see fungi, and for me, these are the potentials. I do not 
um, think of necessarily where in terms of modernization or industrialization, it's always about, you know, a certain, um, how do you call it, sterilization approach to how we deal with um, microbes or maybe go back to a certain nature. For me, uh, a purist sense doesn't exist because nature in itself um, evolves and these organisms have adapted to grow almost on anything. They also modify themselves and I know mutations these days is very scary when we hear of COVID and so on but these are the, yeah, these are the realities um, of things where it's much the, I would say that the much problem with approaching industrialization or synthesizations of anything, it's much more about relationship, yes. And I think it's these days that people are restructuring how to, you know, create cement that is accommodative of, you know, um, other living species as well. So I think it's just a restructuring, not necessarily that um, industrial materials are bad or necessarily bad, it's not all the time. Nature in itself, um, evolves out of violence. And for me, um, yeah, this is Wache. Um, Wache is a Ghanaian local dish which is made from rice and beans. And for my work, um, I always start from this idea of plasticity where, you know, things can always simulate and suggest other things. So the appearance of a thing is always an illusion sort of. Yeah, like the way, um, for instance, the same plastics that could be used for, you know, toilet pipes can also transform into rosaries and sacred objects and other things. There's always an elusive quality when it comes to plasticity. And for me, that's the approach of which I look at my work. And yeah, just as soils, <laughs> it's the same way. And I look at soils as not just what we know as soil, but as a substrate for things to grow, for things to emerge. And I think that's the kind of quality um, many of the artists, our works really um, deal with. So that's uh, Wache, that's the rice and beans. And in every culture has this, uh, you know, different name to it. So one interesting thing about this work is obviously, uh, even though one says it's rice and beans, you wouldn't necessarily know unless to maybe smell, but every culture <laughs> influences how you, what you think this thing is. So that's what I'm dealing with with my work. And of course, the way, the process, and I also look at one interesting thing about working with food. At times I play the devil of, you know, people say I do waste a lot of food. Yeah, but I play the devil in removing a certain human agency of, you know, just looking at food as something to be consumed by humans, by using even processed foods like biscuits or maybe Pringles from a supermarket that is meant for human beings to eat and use it for my work that becomes almost nonsensical to human use. And yeah, begins to look at um, how microbes like Neurospora crassa uh, in which I begin to use certain ingredients that invite these particular forms or living organisms that begin to grow my, on my work. So these are just some shots. These are Neurospora classa. They really love these kind of conditions. Uh, some of the conditions are nutrients that are created from sogin leaves and all of that. Yes, and this was made from uh, biscuits, butter cake biscuits, yeah. So these are more of my works. And yes, another important dynamic to looking at soils, um, for me, uh, as I'd already mentioned, like in terms of plasticity, is how thermodynamic principles, you know, the fundamental of thermodynamism really is um, at work in every form of matter or whatsoever, the way soils, um, the way soils behave, the way plants behave, the way your foods behave, using all these thermodynamic principles and the way they elude to you know different forms we see. 
yeah, this is a work I created with Pringles. I call it Martian Pringles. It's very interesting. It's in the space and it's almost in the place like it's, you know, perspiring, like a sweating within the space. So these are the interesting forms. So I do deal with synthetic worlds in order to reimagine the possibilities of creating, you know, the, the alienic forms are already implied with how everything is. We cannot necessarily explore the entire potentiality of a thing. That's almost impossible. And I would say that when it comes to synthesization, we are actually mimicking what is already there than really um, inventing. Yeah, so these are just a few things to share. So these are like some of our exhibitions that we, we've had. And I like one word that um, Alexander mentioned, that's like um, permeability, membranes. And this is an exhibition, you know, it's not a standard white cube where every work, you know, is autonomous to each other. We, we, we've had, this was a cornfield in Accra, one of the first large scale exhibitions um, in the city. And to have works that engage with each other, some works will distract other works, you are not going to build a space where one work doesn't infect each other. These are the kind of um, possibilities. And when we talk about ecology, it's not only just you know mutual exchanges, but it can be very parasitic as well. Yes, because these are multiple artists. You have this cock crowing and just moving around, doing its own thing. It can just destroy works and all of that. that but that becomes something very interesting and important when it comes to the discourse of art and critiquing our relations with the world. So one of the interesting things that, um, you know, comes from works like this, this is from Livingston Amako, is how it begins to change even, um, it, it begins to make us look at, re-look at even what curating is. And um, this, uh, Salom Kuji, who is the current director of Savannah Center for Contemporary Art. And the term of curating will definitely change when you are bringing in life forms. Now, it's not only about caring for um, art or um, inanimate objects and all of that. Now, what happens to care? How do we bring that to the exhibition space? How do you care for the cockerel, the snails, I bet the snails had a good time. Like you prepare salads <laughs> and all special for these snails. So that becomes very important integration. Yes, so these are all uh, snails. This is from Livingston Marcus shells. And uh, these are shell snails. And these are the presences we are dealing with. As I said, it's much more about really looking at our relationships yeah, with the world. And yes, this is um, some part of my family. Um, this was an exhibition. Um, I'm going to show something interesting. This is SCCA Tamale, Savannah Center for Contemporary Arts. It's in the northern part of Ghana. And yeah, it's one of the few places or spaces, I would say, um, if you want to, you know, do something of, you know, white cube and you know, selling traditions of arts. It's one of the few spaces in Ghana that allows you know, room for experimentation and all that. So when I saw, like you see an image like this, when I saw, um, oh, when I saw oh, <laughs> your name, so, yeah, Daniel, Daniel Lee and the institution, you know, will not allow even just a speckle of dust, you know, <laughs> in the space. These are real things to deal with. Yeah, and for me, they are more interesting things. And um, of course, because of the association of what debt is, um, but they are more interesting things, you know, in allowing debt and all of that. And it's also interesting, like putting, someone will be like, okay, but there's still white cube in there. No, but it's interesting because this is a space where kids come, so guess what will happen? <laughs> yeah, though you have these white spaces, this will, um, so this uh, was an exhibition I co-created 
with colleagues of mine. It was one of the brutal ways of honestly um, dealing with soil. It was really, really, really difficult, but very um, important. So like this was the space before Terrazzo and transforming the entire space. But one of the things why I brought this here is in dealing with our relationship with you know, non-humans, Someone would ask, where did we get the soil from? This is from, we um, crushed until termites, and we are distracting colonies and all of that. And you realize that there is a thin line between exploitation and collaboration, honestly. Like, how do you produce a thing without violence? It's almost impossible, honestly. To make clothes, you have some tree will go, you know. Yeah, so these are the real things we do with. So, yeah, and as I already reiterated, nature in itself um, is not, I like what Timothy Morton says, says that, sorry, I gave myself a bit of time. Okay, so like I already reiterated, nature in itself, Timothy Morton would say that nature seems to be like you know, like some daydreaming where all our dreams are untouched and looks pure and beautiful and all of that. But this violence is already inherent in nature. For queen termites, after, you know, maybe 20 years or something and the worker ants find no use for it, you know, they lick it till the queen ant dies. And these are the realities. So they are, these are the things that we constantly do with, even when, um, we have themes of ecology and all of that, but a reality of production has inherently has a bit of violence, but it's about how to still deal with all these things um, in a much more um, ethical manner. Yeah, so this is one of some of my works. And of course, uh, my works using, you know, these already processed foods, which invites, you know, um, flies and so on, and microbes and fungi. Yeah, there are some parts of my work that I do with sterilization in a very interesting way. Um, at times my work, um, you know, almost uh, sort of maybe might create a certain beauty until the person asks how this was, you know, produced, and realize beauty itself also has a certain inherence of violence. And what you see over here in this image is hydrogen peroxide decompositioning. That is using hydrogen peroxide, what we use for sanitizers and stuff, and using it to treat these membranes that has a lot of microbial life in there and as it disrupts the, their cell walls and creates these bubbles that reveals itself within the substrates. It's almost like uh, those works you find at the back. Um, there are substrates like that, like what I was saying, they're very elusive presences. And for me, it's the elusive presences of even microbes themselves and using these kind of method before people you know, realize these host of colonies, because when you have plastic material and it's plain, you assume it's, you know, there's nothing there. The silences, but very much present. And for me, that is the invisible presences that um, intrigues me. So these are like uh, more images of that. So the image to the right is one that is not exposed to hydrogen peroxide. And you see the violence that is inherent within these processes. Yes, and I brought this image. This is almost like a tableau, you know, viva, like you are. Um, in one of these exhibition was by, um, we were honoring the work of um, uh, Dr. Ajiman Osei, who is a very interesting artist. Uh, he looks at uh, uh, local proverbs. We call it Akan proverbs. Yeah, and you know, proverbs have a very interesting way of depicting the world. Um, yes, and for him, yeah, when we talk about beauty and all of that, so in one of our exhibitions, like the way we're dealing with, you know, COVID and the idea of a certain separation and use of screens and all of that, and it's detaching us from 
you know, a certain material. And um, one of the exhibitions, we decided, you know, to, to mine from the images of the paintings and bring it to, you know, the space and to realize new engagements with the work. And there's an interesting account proverb that talks about, you know, beauty and how God, you know, decorates um, its creatures. That's how um, we deal with it. But we were looking at more into, you know, the interesting ways of which plants, of course, these are plants, but <laughs> they don't necessarily live with soil, but water lilies. So these are some of the spaces we realize, spaces where people could, you know, come together. And I remember when people try vainly, how do you time, you know, <laughs> uh, a water lily when it's about blooming? It exists in its own um, time, and you don't even see when it even blooms and all of that. But there are beautiful things that happen with chances. And uh, we brought in water lilies, and we ended up having a water, um, the hyacinth coming in there. Like, these are the potentialities that, um, yeah, I'm talking about with soils, with, um, you know, things in general. Even if things seem to be artificial, they are not necessarily impermeable. They can be permeable. And we've seen that with hybrid forms. And even when microbes are able to evolve to eat plastics and all, this is one of the exhibitions by um, my colleague friend, uh, Patrick Okanta. And what you find here is, um, yeah, a horn moth. It was because of, you know, um, horns that were placed in the space. And these horn moths, you know, come and weave their whole, you know, create a whole interesting ecosystem. But what you find here, is uh, work I made with styrofoam. Yeah, so styrofoam, because it has a lot of content of air, and I redissolve it back into petrol. You know, they are all petrol source, but so in a way it releases that trapped air to it, and it becomes something much more, you know, transparent, you could see, and all of that. It was very interesting how these moths will come around my work and nest on it. So these are the very interesting engagements, yeah. And also, oh, okay, all right, I'm almost done. Yeah, and also when we are thinking about soil, obviously, um, maybe people wouldn't consider maybe machines or even metal and so on. But yeah, this is um, a painting by um, Jonathan, Jonathan Okoronko. He almost does something similar, like the way I was talking about, you know, um, styrofoam, you dissolve it and it goes back to itself. It's almost destructive to itself, almost like a, you know, like a pharmacon or an Ouroboros, you know, it's in its own self. And he does something similar using acids where the, he dissolves, you know, the scrap parts of, you know, steel and it becomes almost like you know soil and matter and you wouldn't even know how it's like but that's to inform the you know the interesting ways we deal with material and you know we sort of create these elusive boundaries about what's artificial what is not and so and so forth but you know this is all coming from the from the earth metals and ions and so on and just as like cement I mentioned, where is coming from limestone? That's, that's also soil. And of course, the problematic soils of oil and all of that, which are yeah, still things to you know, deal with when it comes to the Anthropocene. So um, I'll be ending soon. I'll be ending the presentation soon. But these are some of my work installations. Um, this was made from uh, a local dish we called fufu. It's made of uh, plantain, plantain and cassava. And what happens here, I use, I usually use bio, simple bioplastic process. But one of my fascinations is how, you know, heat begins to form things. So all these like um, permutations is formed through heat and light and 
that has been one of the interesting things where artists begin to collaborate, you know, with um, all these natural uh, processes. And it's also political at times. I, I use, I intentionally use, you know, industrial processed, um, industrial processed foods. So that's the, like the local fufu on the left, and that's the processed one where it's processed in, how do you call it, as a dough, then you cook it, and all of that. So these are like the, yeah, the politics I deal with when it comes to food. And food always is a very interesting thing. Um, I know we are still used to the idea of humans consume food and all of that, and, um, there's a scholar I love so much, uh, Dr. Yuval Harari. Um, he, he said something interesting, you know, about wheat. That if you look at wheat from its perspective, it's really been successful, like a very brutal colonizer, actually, because for ten thousand years we break our backs for just this plant. We make it more resistant, all because it has influenced a form of taste. And because of that impact of desire, and just like a, a bee, you know, a flower to a bee and all of that, because it wants that, because of the influence of desire, we go at length to, you know, um, make wheat one of the most successful plants in the world. And it's one of the first, you know, plants that, you know, you know forced we humans to start this mono, you know, farm, mono farming, monoculture, and all of that. Breaking our backs, you know, just because of wheat. And these are um, real, you know, things and influences by, you know, just these grains. And today, it's, it's real, like Ukraine war right now. <laughs> People are worried about wheat. So these are real things. And yeah, because of that, we cut off a lot of, you know, forests just to give room for wheat to survive. Get it. So these are some of the real things. Yeah. And um yeah. So this is work by Samuel Bakote and um one lovely curator I love. Um her name is Robin Riskin. Yeah, so um Samuel Bakote collaborates you know, with horticulturalists as well. Um, when he does paintings, his paintings are made with cow blood. Yes, all his, uh, most of his works is made of cow blood. And as he makes his paintings, he also, you know, grows these um, orchids and cucumber plants to grow around it, to, to change the idea of the image, you know, of painting and transforming the meanings we associate to paint and some of his works too, I've seen some of his works that are like, um, I wish I included it here, that are eaten off by termites. And it's very interesting how, you know, the engagement, but like I said, to reiterate, um, at times when we deal with collaboration, you know, the exploitation <laughs> bits could be there as well, like in inside. Yeah, so these are just shots of some of his um, his works. So you find mold growing from his works and so on. Yeah, this is one of the exhibitions by Robin Riskin. And um, one of the important things I just want to highlight, yeah, is that notion of debt I already mentioned. Um, she printed a curatorial text, and this decision for me is really profound. You know, actually, like, in such a site like this, um, usually you just take a duster, you know, clean off the bus, and you get me. But she decided, no, I'm not going to, you know, I want the debt to be part. Um, it's a memory. And this is the, one of the uh, abandoned railways in the country. And for her, the memory of the dust and the histories to the space, why? erase it. It's almost like a forensic. And for her, so she decided to, you know, just print the curatorial text on a transparent material and lay it with the dead. So for me, yeah, these are the interesting conversations I think, yeah, we could have 
on you know we looking at our relations with things with death with soil with fungi yeah thank you very much thank you tracy <laughs> We will have to rush our program a little bit. And um, does anybody have one question for Tracy? Let's do what we got, Rebecca. Thank you for presenting. This was really inspiring. I, I um, took some notes, of course, <laughs> and pictures, and I noted that the, when you said the nature of curating changes when you bring in living organisms. And um, just in a few more sentences, maybe, if you could say something about what happens in that intersection between um, bringing nature into these more sterile gallery rooms. Sorry, sorry, please repeat the question. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the, mm -hmm. how you, the curate when you bring in living organisms. Yeah. And um, if you can say something about maybe the challenges of okay. bringing this into um, art spaces. Yeah, yeah. One of the, you know, the challenge too is now the idea of cleaning, you know, <laughs> becomes very, you know, tricky because um, to many of the cleaners, you know, automatically, you know, let me just clean off this, maybe the dust or the poop from the cork. It's a very challenging thing, but it's very needed. You know, that's what I was saying, that us also need, we need at times, you know, not just conviviality, but we need to intentionally create certain tensions, you know, to rethink some of these things. So these are the real challenges with it. And people having allergies and all of that, these are the real things to deal with. And it's not only just in exhibition space, but I, I'm sure a lot of artists working in such manner, there are times where you cannot just control, you know, microbes from growing. They're quite invasive. It could give you, like, where well, I'm suffering from cold today, it would give you a whole lot of allergy. So when, so that's why I was saying that I will not um, necessarily take the straight ground on where it feels like at times we wouldn't get rid of, you know, those things. But at times you would, in terms of health risk and all of that. Yeah, you would. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's my answer, but thanks for your question. Thank you so much, Tracy. You're um, welcome.